Hey everyone and welcome to the Shop Talk 2024 recap. Uh, we're letting the last uh, few people filter into the live version of the webinar. Uh, I'm Jason Retail Geek Goldberg. I'm the Chief Commerce Strategy Officer for the group and I will be your tour guide uh, for today's recap. Um, just to orient you a little bit, there is a question and answer feature um, in the the Zoom uh, meeting that I'm sure everyone's familiar with by now. Uh, if you do have any questions as we go, um, please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A. Uh, depending on how verbose I am and how time goes, um, we may try to answer some of the questions live at the end of the webinar, but even if we don't have time, uh, we'll make sure we get answers to you and get them to you offline. I know the question we always get most often uh, is, can we get a copy of the deck? And absolutely, you can get a copy of the deck. Uh, we, we will send out a link uh, after the event to everyone, so you are, you're welcome to a copy of the deck. The only thing I ask is uh, that if you, you reuse this deck and give your own recap of Shop Talk later and you do a better job than I did, don't tell me because my ego, my ego can't take it. Um, so uh, I think uh, with that out of the way, uh, I will tell you in the highly unlikely event um, that any of you don't get enough of me um, in, in uh, this, this time slot today, the great news is there's like 400 more hours of me on the interweb. Um, so uh, with a lot of my, my uh, commerce colleagues, I publish a, a podcast every week. Uh, it has a horrible name. It's called The Jason and Scott Show. My friend Scott uh, spelled his name wrong, so there's only one T in Scott, which makes it super easy to find. And we're the top rated podcast on, on digital commerce uh, on iTunes. And uh, we talk about this kind of stuff every week. This week, there's a very popular deep dive episode on Timu, the interesting uh, direct uh, manufacturer to consumer model from China. Um, so uh, with that, we're gonna jump into Shop Talk. I'm gonna turn on my slides in just one second. I just wanna orient you uh, slightly to Shop Talk. So uh, Shop Talk was founded in 2016. This is the eighth show. They skipped one show uh, during COVID. Um, so this is the eighth show in Las Vegas. Uh, every um, spring, it was March 17th through the 20th this week, so it started on Sunday. A lot of people fly in Saturday to get the Sunday content or fly in sometime Sunday, and it runs through Wednesday afternoon. Um, the, uh, we have a huge presence at the show. Uh, um, Epsilon uh, Retail Media has a, a, a big uh, display booth. Uh, uh, CJ has a booth there. Um, uh, myself and several of my, my colleagues, Amy Lanzi and Sabrina McPherson, um, uh, had featured sessions at the show. And about 60 of my colleagues at Publicis attend the event in some capacity. And I would just like the record to show that 59 of those um, colleagues got home uh, yesterday from Shop Talk and went on spring break today. Um, and uh, my friend Mary and I said, we're not going on spring break. We're doing a recap for our thousand closest friends that couldn't make it to Shop Talk. So thrilled to be here talking with you about Shop Talk instead of on some, some luxurious beach. Um, one more fun fact. Uh, I am one of the few people lucky enough to have attended all, all eight uh, shop talks. Uh, so I, I have a very cherished collection of badges, but even more cherished when you're a speaker at shop talk, they send you one of these mugs and they've been sending them every year since they first started doing the show with your face on them. So uh, I've been fortunate enough to be a speaker at every show. So I have a complete collection of mugs, um, which my in-laws are super thrilled uh, to drink coffee out of my out of my face every morning. Um, this, for those of you keeping track at home, this is the the official 2024 uh, version of, of the mug. Um, so with uh, that out of the way, I'm gonna go for what is always the most dangerous part of my presentation, which is um, switching to the slides, which hopefully I, I have been successful at. Someone will jump in if, if not. Um, so this is the, the podcast we were talking about. Um, uh, I, I mentioned, you know, our, our big presence and why we, we have some credibility and authority uh, to talk about this show and hopefully get everyone up to speed. Um, so a big part of this show is a huge uh, exhibit hall. Uh, this show is at the convention center at the Mandalay Bay. It uses the whole convention center. This year there were over 900 booths. Two years ago there were about 300 booths, so it's growing quite a bit. All the big technology partners are, are have a big presence here. So uh, Salesforce, Shopify, BigCommerce, 
commerce tools um, are all here in big uh, uh, forces. I mentioned uh, Epsilon has a big uh, booth in the, the lower center of, of this particular slide. Um, but one of the interesting things you'll notice on the trade show floor is a lot of retailers are, actually have uh, big booths at Shop Talk. So Amazon has a very big presence with two booths. Walmart had the biggest, most impressive booth at the show. Uh, I'm, I'm showing the front half of it in the upper uh, center and the bottom half of it in the lower left. Um, uh, that's the price you pay for the deck getting put together so so quickly as I should have put those slides next to each other. Um, but the Walmart recreated uh, Sam Walton's office uh, the, uh, and the, the facade from the Walmart Museum, which used to be the the Walton Five and Dime uh, in downtown Bentonville. Um, uh, um, Instacart had a large booth. And you may ask yourself, why do all these retailers have booths here? We're going to get more into that. Um, but the, the answer is because they all have a bunch of businesses they sell to other retailers, right? So uh, both Amazon and Walmart uh, are recruiting um, sellers for their marketplaces. Am Walmart will deliver your goods with uh, Go Local. Um, uh, Amazon uh, wants you to use their payment methodology um, and of course their fulfillment services and this whole suite of services that they call uh, Walmart today or Amazon today. So lots of uh, interesting retailers trying to sell stuff to other retailers in addition um, uh, to, to the typical technology vendors. Folks like Instacart, which is kind of a retailer, kind of a marketplace, also have a lot of retail technologies like a smart cart, that, uh, a point of sale system that they're selling to grocery stores. And then in the lower right hand corner um, is a picture of what I always find to be one of the more interesting sections of the show. It's the startup pavilion. So if you're a new technology vendor and maybe you can't justify getting your own booth and you know having a really expensive display, you can get sort of a, a, a modest kiosk for yourself. And there are a lot of innovative companies um, that are kind of making their first introduction to retailers at the show in the startup pavilion. Um, and uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about what some of the themes were there uh, a bit later. Uh, of course, one of the main reasons people attend Shop Talk is for the content. Um, Shop Talk historically has always gotten uh, very good speakers. Um, and particularly on the, the keynote stage. So we had eight big keynotes this year. Um, we had uh, Colleen Aubrey, who's the, who's, I misspelled her name on this slide, I just noticed, uh, but I uh, apologize, Colleen, but Colleen's uh, the SVP of ads uh, and product, uh, ad products at Amazon. Uh, Tony Spring is the CEO of Macy's. Uh, Gina Boswell is the CEO of Bath and, Beyond, uh, Bath and Body Works. Robbie Benner the, uh, um, and, and Steve uh, Toski are the president of Mattel and Mattel Media. Um, that was a super interesting keynote. Uh, Maria Rez, the uh, head of commerce at Google, um, the, the COO from Procter & Gamble, the CEO and grandson of the founder at Canada Goose, um, and Tom Kingsbury, the CEO at Kohl's. Um, so a bunch of really interesting keynotes. We'll talk a bit about some of the key themes from them as well. Um, and then in addition to those eight keynotes, there were hundreds of sessions on the featured stage. Um, all the really good looking people in that in that upper uh, session are, uh, was hosted by uh, my friend and colleague Amy Lanzi. Uh, um, that's Jill Toscano in the middle. She's the SVP of media at Walmart. Um, and th this panel was talking about the future of shoppable video uh, with TikTok and Fanatics as well as Walmart. Um, and then the session on the bottom was a, a session uh, I hosted about um, uh, the the ending of the channels in uh, customer journeys and how we're blurring all the lines between all these customer journeys. And I had great digital leaders from uh, a wide variety of retailers. So uh, LVMH, uh, Kindle Brands, uh, Georgia Pacific, uh, and Wayfair all participating in, in that conversation. And then another feature of Shop Talk are these meetups. Um, and so this used to be a sort of uh, paid system where if you were a retailer and you couldn't afford to attend the show, Shop Talk would, would pay for or subsidize your attendance if you agreed to meet with some vendors. And there still is a little program like that, but what they actually found is what worked better is voluntary meetings between vendors and retailers where both sides are interested. So this is sort of like Tinder for retail, where a bunch of retailers go to the show and they say, hey, I'm really looking for supply chain solutions or payment solutions. And a bunch of vendors say, hey, I'm really interested in talking 
talking to that retailer and if the two match up, uh, they schedule a short speed date, like a, a 15 minute uh, meeting at the show. There are uh, thousands of meetings at this show. It's a cavernous meeting space that's you know really busy during all the, the assigned times. Um, if any of you are fans of Indiana Jones, I'm pretty sure the Ark, the Lost Ark of the Covenant is hidden somewhere um, in, in this, uh, this meetup section. Um, and uh, Shop Talk surprised us by kind of announcing a, a new show within a show for next year. So next year at this spring event, so spring uh, 2025 in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay, um, uh, Shop Talk is going to have a new event called The New Market. And this is in response to all of the commerce media that has become part of this ecosystem and obviously the emergence of retail media networks and uh, clickable ads and, um, and content producers all sort of blending with the commerce space. They're now going to have a, des a designated track and uh, you know, a physical area as a subset of Shop Top 2025. Um, they also announced a new show last year, which is going to happen this year. Um, so normally we have this Shop Talk show every um, spring. Uh, there's a Shop Talk Europe show in the summer that's in Barcelona. I'd be happy to meet all of you there. Um, the, uh, there's a dedicated grocery show called Grocery Shop uh, that's this October back in the Mandalay Bay. And then last year they announced for the first time that this year in 2024 they would be coming to my hometown of Chicago in October right after uh, Grocery Shop. And so this is going to be a show that's going to have a little less content and a little more featured on the network, uh, focused on the networking and meetups. So this is going to be a first time show this October 16th through the 18th. Um, here in Chicago, um, Mary uh, Cusack, who's the brains behind this whole webinar, and myself both live here in Chicago, so uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to host something and meet any, any folks that want to come, come to that event this year. Um, and she's rapidly probably writing down the commitment I just made for all of us. Um, so uh, what were the big themes and takeaways that we should all learn from Shop Talk this year? Uh, well, we, we got together after the show and kind of consolidated notes, and we really lumped them into these four big categories. Um, you know, of course, you can't uh, go to any show uh, or do anything um, without talking about generative AI these days, and that was certainly to it, true at Shop Talk. Um, uh, again, retail media network is a uh, you know increasingly um, frequent conversation at all of these events, and and uh, there were a lot of advanced conversations happening again this year. Um, there was also a lot of kind of talk about fundamentals and getting back to basics uh, at at the show this year. Um, and the last category is what I'm calling the battle for attention, and it's kind of the blurring of the lines between media and commerce. Um, and how uh, you know we're we're not just fighting with our traditional retailers, uh, but we're now fighting with with uh, you know some very advanced content pro producers uh, for the attention and ultimately uh, the the spending uh, intent of uh, all these consumers. Um, so let with that, let's jump into the first of the four trends. Um, which is generative AI. Uh, many of you will know you can't spell publicist awesomeness without uh, uh, AI, so it's very important uh, letters in the alphabet. Um, one of the big conversations at Shop Talk is uh, is generative AI overhyped or underhyped, right? And, and literally that explicit question was asked uh, several, several times on stage by various presenters uh, to a wide variety of different answers. Um, my own answer is that it's simultaneously both. Um, and what I mean by that is in the short term, the benefits that people are claiming today um, are probably overhyped. Um, if, if you were to go to this show, you would see AI tattooed on all 900 exhibitors. And frankly, not all 900 exhibitors are AI, or certainly AI is not what's important about many of those exhibitors. But everybody feels this need um, to, you know, tattoo AI into their business model right now, which is, you know, frankly, a little um, annoying and kind of dilutes uh, a lot of these conversations. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to get solicited by lots of vendors that have exciting new ideas. And m many of them reach out uh, through LinkedIn. And the most common thing I get right now is we've just reinvented commerce with AI. Will you meet with us? And 
uh, spoiler alert, if you are one of those vendors, no, I won't meet with you if that's your pitch. Like, you, uh, uh, I do like to meet new people, I like to hear new ideas, but you have to articulate a business problem you're solving. And reinventing commerce with AI is you telling me about a tool you like to play with. It's not you telling me about a business problem that you tried to tackle. So in the short run, we sort of feel like um, uh, AI is, is, although important, is overhyped. But in the long run, my hypothesis is we're all underestimating what a giant disruptive force uh, AI is going to be to commerce. Uh, I've, I've spent the last 20 years of my career talking about the huge disruption that is digital commerce and how um, what a huge disruption the internet is to commerce. And in the 6,000 year history of commerce, um, disruptions as big as the internet are very few and far between. Like arguably there have only been sort of four in the whole, whole history of commerce. Um, and yet, uh, 20 years after I started talking about digital disruption, I feel like uh, the disruption from AI may be even greater than the disruption of the internet on commerce. So pretty interesting. Um, if you listen to all the conversations at the show, they kind of lump into these three big categories. Um, uh, this is a, a, a slide I actually borrowed from the, the Shop Talk uh, content team. Uh, they, they publish a piece of content every year called the Shop Talk Zeitgeist. And, uh, um, uh, so there, there are three categories were sort of improving productivity and efficiency, uh, enhancing the customer experience and creativity. Um, so uh, on that improving efficiencies, one of the use cases that emerged uh, as the most common and the one that seems like it's gotten the most early traction and providing the most tangible benefit in 2024 to retailers is employee enablement. Um, so, uh, there, you know, one of the keynotes, uh, was John Alperson, who's the EVP, uh, and uh, chief product officer at Walmart. Uh, Walmart has this app that they make available to all employees over, over 2 million, uh, Walmart associates use the me at Walmart app. Uh, and last August, they rolled out, uh, an AI assistant called my assistant to 50,000 non-store workers that they could start using to ask, answer work questions through the me at Walmart app. Uh, this January, they expanded it to uh, another 25,000 uh, users. So, so Walmart has 75,000 users that are um, using this, this generative AI chatbot as their primary interface um, with all of the corporate knowledge at Walmart and all of the data that they, they need to use their job every day. Um, and uh, the, the claimed benefit already that those employees are 100% more productive um, than they were before the app rolled out. I don't know exactly how John uh, measures that, but it um, that that seems super uh, compelling to me if true. Um, but uh, adding credibility to that, he was far from alone. So uh, Tapestry gave a presentation talking about their employment employee AI based uh, solutions. Abercrombie, mattress firm, uh, lots of retailers talked about. AI for employees being their first deployment. And then one of the interesting keynotes on the main stage I mentioned was the COO of Procter and Gamble. Um, and Shalesh talked about actually uh, using AI for employee institutional knowledge management. So he talked about how many employees Procter and Gamble has and that over time people leave to go elsewhere or retire. And that historically, a lot of institutional knowledge left with those employees. They, they wipe the laptops, they delete the email, all of these things. Um, that an employee might have built up all this knowledge over over a 10 or 15 year Procter & Gamble career and it just kind of vaporizes when that employee leaves. And now um, using AI, uh, they're retaining and categorizing all of that data and making it available. And you, you think about, you, you essentially can have an LLM, you know, trained on any former employee and still ask that former employee questions after they've retired. Um, so uh, potentially creepy, but very interesting uh, use case, uh, but I, I feel like in the the aggregate, it's very clear that one of the early areas that folks are getting uh, real value out of uh, generative AI in 2024 um, is employee enablement and optimization. Um, another example uh, that that Walmart shared of their AI is in the next category is that customer experience category. So on the right, we're seeing Walmart's uh, uh, iOS app. Um, and they enhanced, uh, this January, they enhanced uh, their iOS app with a generative AI search. So, you know, they would point out that, hey, the average American family spends six hours a week 
um, planning their with their household planning and shopping um, and that you know a big part of that is searching for products in retailers like Walmart when they they learned to type keywords right so they they did searches for things like pizza or ice cream or beer um, and you know when you do that search for ice cream um, or, or rather when you do that search for cookies you might get cookie dough ice cream um, as a search result in those those keywords pizza could could give you a search result for a frozen pizza or the pizzeria in the front of the the Walmart store um, and increasingly with generative AI you can ask more contextually relevant questions like help me plan a football watch party or what supplies do I need for my newborn um, and uh, the idea is to to help that that family save time and live better um, uh, through generative AI uh, an early customer experience that Walmart's rolled out that's been very well received by their their members is at their Costco stores where in the big club stores you, you, you stand in line, you check out, you buy your, your 200 items, and as you wheel them out the door, um, a, an, an employee has to do a receipt check to make sure that the, the, the clerk didn't make a, a significant mistake in what was checked out. And uh, um, customers are really dislike that piece of friction as they're trying to get out of the store. Um, and at Sam's Club, they've, they're actually abolishing the receipt check and you just wheel your cart uh, through these these portals. You can use scan and go to kind of skip the, the clerk altogether and you just wheel your groceries out. The cameras in the, the portal take pictures of your cart and uh, what used to be a slow process with a human is now a fast process with computer vision and generative AI. Um, so a very interesting use case. Uh, Google also did a keynote. They talked about uh, some of their generative AI shopping features. Uh, what we're seeing on the screen here um, is a feature they've rolled out in their premium Android phones called um, Circle the Search. So if you're in an image, you can uh, you know, circle or scribble or highlight on a handbag to, to then you know, go through the entire Google shopping graph and find products um, uh, that, that match the, the item you just took a picture of. Uh, we were all joking on uh, Amy's panel at Shop Talk. Uh, uh, Jill Toscano was wearing some amazing Stella McCartney shoes, um, and we 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 think we we spotted the trend on Google uh, Trend uh, that a lot of people in the audience were taking pictures of of uh, Jill's uh, cool uh, designer tennis shoes um, and uh, 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 you know making them them shoppable. Uh, through the, the, the engine. And uh, uh, interestingly, the shoes are sold at Walmart and, and sold out during the, the, the um, show. So I, I think like the depth was, pro uh, inventory depth was probably pretty thin to start with, but it was a fun story. Um, Meta also uh, talked about some of their future shopping experiences in AI. Um, and so uh, uh, Karen Tracy is the head of, of uh, retail and luxury at Meta. Um, she talked about them using their multimodal uh, gen AI engine in um, their, their Ray-Ban branded Meta smart glasses. So these glasses have a microphone in them and you can speak to the, the, uh, the Meta generative AI system through the glasses you're wearing on your face. Um, and she, she did a really compelling demo where she um, uh, you know, talked to the glasses um, about like what she should wear to do this presentation at Shop Talk. And the, the AI model made some suggestions for what, uh, what would make the best impression for her to wear. And then she asked for recommendations on where to buy those products. And uh, in, in her case, she was, she was led to a, a, a particular retailer, um, all using generative AI, all via multimodal voice into this, this um, uh, Meta uh, glasses product. So pretty, pretty cool uh, view into the near future. Um, in a DoorDash session, they talked about how AI had already dramatically improved a huge pain point in shopping, um, which is substitutions, uh, particularly in grocery where the cart is very large, it's 60 to 100 items. Uh, the items aren't, aren't reserved when you order them. When you order a t-shirt, uh, the, the, the uh, fulfillment center decrements the inventory in that t-shirt the second you order it. So that inventory is allocated to you. But when you order a banana from uh, um, DoorDash, the, or Instacart or one of those providers, um, 
Nobody goes and gets that banana until it's time for that shopper to walk around the store and pick all your products. And the banana may get out of stock between the time you ordered it and the time they try to pick it. And so there's this huge business problem of suggesting the right thing to replace that banana. Is it a, a, another piece of organic fruit if you tried to get an organic banana? Or is it a non-organic banana? Or is it a bigger bunch of bananas or more ripe bananas? All interesting questions. And I, I went into my, my own library of sort of fun recommendation engines um, from the last couple of years in actual consumer shopping carts. And you can see someone tried to order some cottage cheese and they got a Christmas ornament. Someone tried to order some crunchy peanut butter and got a glue stick. And my all time favorite, uh, someone tried to order some baby wipes and got a, a bottle of Bell's whiskey, which I, uh, um, I'm trying to imagine the, the programming behind that particular substitution. But these are all substitutions of the past um, as uh, uh, folks like DoorDash are using AI to make much more contextually relevant uh, substitutions that look at all your past purchase and all the first party data they have about you to more wisely uh, do products. Um, Shandu Nair, who's the SVP of uh, Computational Intelligence, which um, uh, sounds like a terrifying title to me at Lowe's, talked about how uh, they're using um, generative AI um, to uh, visualize products that don't exist. So when you're designing your own kitchen, you can visualize it. They have a version of this experience now published uh, to the Apple Vision Pro, which is what this, this screenshot is from. Um, so lots of interesting use cases for, for generative AI in both the optimization, employee enablement, um, in uh, the, the um, customer experience, uh, 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 use cases and then the creativity uh, uh, use cases uh, for AI. Um, the, the second big trend we talked about from Shop Talk is, is retail media. Uh, probably won't surprise anyone uh, that that came up a lot. Um, one of the, the things uh, that I think is humorous that retail media is sort of part of is this thing we call the battle for beyond the trade. Um, so traditionally retailers um, made money by selling stuff, right? Like you bought a banana for 80 cents and you sold it for a dollar and so you made 20 cents. That would be the highest margin of banana everywhere, ever, ever by the way. I don't know why I picked that example. Um, but uh, you know, retailers made money on um, the, the gap between the wholesale and retail prices. Um, increasingly, retailers are trying to make money in other businesses that are related to commerce, right? And so retail media is, of course, the biggest of these businesses, but other businesses are things like selling data to customers like Walmart Luminate um, or uh, selling professional services to other retailers like uh, um, Amazon Buy with Prime or Walmart Go Local. Um, and so uh, a lot of retail fell into this this category that we'll call battle for beyond trade, the fight to win business beyond the trade business. Um, and uh, Steve Muborn of May, uh, Bain uh, had sort of an interesting caution uh, for retailers that were getting excited about this. And his point was, you can only be good at beyond trade if you already are good at trade. And so his advice was, um, that you know, if trade is the foundation under which you offer all these other services, uh, don't bother trying to sell your data. Don't bother trying to launch a retail media network. Um, if you're losing customer intimacy and you're losing share to competitors and you're in a declining market, um, that that's building a business on a on a shaky foundation, and that you know, no one doesn't, no one wants to buy data from a retailer that doesn't know their customers very well. And so, you know, sort of a cautionary tale that um, maybe there's a little bit too much exuberism or over some of the, the, the opportunities in Beyond Trade, although certainly many of those opportunities are very real. Um, specifically on retail media networks, uh, one of the fun sort of uh, conflicting opinions that emerged at the show, um, uh, one of the keynotes was Colleen Aubrey, who, um, who, as I mentioned earlier, is responsible for all the ad products at Amazon and helped launch the, their ad service. Um, and uh, she, she gave uh, an excellent keynote. Uh, she talked a lot about how like her biggest regret um, is that when they launched the ad product at Amazon, they made the first attribute uh, for targeting ads to be search terms. And she said she regrets that today because 
Uh, too many people fall into the trap of thinking of retail media as a form of search advertising. And she's actually not that bullish on, on what she called search advertising. She's like, search advertising is pretty brain dead. It's, you know, uh, type a keyword, get a result and click off. Um, and in her mind, retail media has the potential to be much higher value, higher funnel and more uh, sticky um, than, than the basic search advertising. And so, you know, uh, a significant portion of her keynote was dedicated to uh, um, retail media is not simply search. Um, and then in one of the breakout sessions, uh, our, our moderator was Andrew Lipson. He, he's been the principal analyst in retail media networks at eMarketer for the last several years. We all use his data about retail media networks uh, almost daily. And he did a presentation where he popped up some of his slides and he said, and by the way, retail media networks are, are mostly uh, search ads and are going to continue to mostly be search ads for the foreseeable future. Um, so, you know, I think there's kind of an interesting conflict between Andrew, who's observing what is happening and Colleen, you know, uh, expressing what she hopes to happen as as the this this tactic and this this category um, continue to grow, um, but a lot of richer, super deep content about retail media networks. So one of the really interesting conversations that kept emerging in these various sessions is about the the measurement and attribution. Um, Eric Ternwoski, who's uh, uh, responsible for media at, at a, a direct -to consumer brand called Kenview, um, he made a point that I really resonated with um, that ROAS is a particularly awful metric for retail media um, because as he said, retail media network, uh, ROAS is not an outcome. He said it can be a useful metric for comparing two like for like campaigns. Um, but what we really want to know is what our outcomes were, what our total performance was in ROAS does doesn't give us that. I'll, I'll pile on there and say ROAS is also an acronym that's supposed to stand for return on ad spend and the R usually doesn't stand for return uh, because it, uh, it usually is is revenue not not profits or income and the S uh, uh, is supposed to be spend and it usually is just the raw cost of the media and not all the other other costs. So for a variety of reasons ROAS is not a great um, uh, metric. Uh, Carrie Sweeney at Pinterest kind of piled on here and said, yeah, you know, if we're just paying a tax on a sale that already would have happened, like this isn't very interesting. We really have to get to incrementality and understand when these impressions are driving a sale that wouldn't otherwise have happened. Um, and at, at that point, um, Andrew uh, um, jumped back in and said that, you know, that he's talking to a lot of clients that are starting to implement what he called iROAS, which is incremental ROAS. And he said it's super interesting because, you know, when you look at costs of media, a lot of the cheapest retail media shows a good ROAS, but an actually very poor iROAS or incremental ROAS. And conversely, a lot of media that seems very expensive and thus has a, a poor ROAS actually has a very good incremental ROAS. So he said kind of using these old legacy advertising metrics to measure this this new media platform um, is, is uh, potentially problematic. Um, my own takeaway from all of this is uh, all the platforms that are selling the media are all evolving their measurement solutions and they're all trying to make better measurement solutions in response to, to advertisers' requests. Uh, the, uh, we, have, we have folks sitting on the IAB working on developing standards for all this, but I actually think in the long run that's not the solution. Um, I, is, if I'm a brand buying media, I don't want anyone's measurement solution. I don't want the IAB's measurement solution. I don't want Meta's uh, measurement solution. I don't want uh, Amazon's measurement solution. I want my own measurement solution that my CFO buys into and will make investment uh, decisions based on. And the only way I can have my own measurement solution is if I can get the data um, from the network providers. And so I think in the long run, that's really how this has to go is I need measurement data to uh, run into my own incrementality model because there just simply isn't going to be a a one-size-fits-all incrementality model in that. Uh, that means that a lot more of these initiatives that we're starting to see around clean rooms and data sharing agreements and things like that become super interesting. Uh, a thing that came up in a couple sessions is that this is really spawning a need for a new kind of employee, uh, what someone called a, a cross-trained athlete, that you really need people that are expert in both media and merchandising, which is um, pretty interesting. Uh, so a lot of uh, super insightful conversations about retail media. I felt like this was a year when the conversations went a lot deeper than just 
should we have a retail media network? Is retail media network a thing? Do you realize how big Am Amazon's retail media network is? Um, we also saw some vendor announcements. Um, Google announced that they are, are now um, partnering with retail media networks uh, in, the, in the Search Ads 360 product. So their first partnership is in beta and live right now with Lowe's. Um, so you can use Lowe's first party data um, from their retail media network to buy uh, ads through Google. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of interesting partnerships, um, particularly as, as uh, uh, some of the big advertising platforms have lost some signal from the depreciation of cookies and mobile challenges and things like that. I think Meta also announced that they were uh, white labeling their advertising platform for retail media networks. So I think the, the big advertisers have noticed that dollars are shifting to retail media and they're all trying to figure out um, how they're going to play in this new space. So that was a big part of the, the mind share at Shop Talk this year, and I'm sure we'll be at other digital shows as we go throughout the year. Um, the third uh, big trend um, is what I call back to basics. Uh, I sometimes call this pragmatic optimism. So one of the things that we frequently talk about on this show is what were the hallway conversations? What were people talking about? What wasn't program content, but just what was the mood of folks? And we're super interested both at NRF earlier this year and Shop Talk uh, now about what is the mood of people that make their living selling stuff to consumers? Do they see the consumer opening their wallet and spending more? Do, are they still being super conservative? Are they still being impacted by inflation or perceived inflation? Um, and, you know, do, are they optimistic or pessimistic for their future? Um, and uh, the, the answer, I, I think folks were a little more optimistic than I expected them to be um, at this show. And, and part of that was what this, what I'm calling pragmatic optimism, that they recognize that there's some endemic headwinds in their categories. There's a few retailers that are doing really well. A lot of other retailers are sort of struggling. Um, you know, we're all comping against these anomalously large years of the last three years, which were the greatest three years in the history of retail. Um, and so there are a lot of challenges, but in the context of those challenges, um, folks were confident they could win their share or more than their share um, of, of uh, the consumer's investment. And a lot of that was through basic block and tackling. Um, so there was just a lot of talk about um, you know, continuing to take friction out of the shopping experience and continuing to break down silos and get to that that true ubiquitous, what used to be called omni-channel customer experience. At Shop Talk, they're, they're trying to rebrand it unified commerce. I, I think all the labels are kind of silly, but what we're, all, what we're talking about here is just commerce. Um, so, uh, helping people buy something wherever they are, whenever uh, they, want, they want to buy it, um, and respecting all of the, the previous interactions on the customer journey um, across all of these touch points. And so there were a lot of folks like really leaning into that. Uh, Mattress Firm was on one of the panels, um, and uh, uh, he talked about how 90% uh, of Mattress Firm sales happen in the store, but 90% of customer journeys happen online. So the most important thing at Mattress Firm is to treat that customer that walks in the store, not like a new customer that hasn't started their shopping journey already, um, but to be respectful of all of the digital interactions you have and make them available to that sleep expert that's standing in the store help, hoping to help uh, that customer close the sale. So that was sort of an interesting point um, from uh, George Hansen. And then two of the big keynotes were two tr legacy retailers that both have some meaningful headwinds right now. It was uh, Macy's and Kohl's. And both of them, you know, talked about their sort of strategies to go forward. And in Macy's case, it's titled The Bold New Chapter. And when you really listen to all the elements of a bold new chapter it's really about getting better at block and tackling retailer when uh, retailing when you hear Coles talk about what they're getting better at um, it's it's really retail fundamentals um, you know Coles talked about how successful Sephora in their stores has been and how they're they're gonna sell over two billion dollars through Sephora uh, this year um, that uh, the, the, the majority of uh, Sephora shoppers in Kohl's are new to Kohl's. 40% of them have never shopped at Kohl's before and they're younger and more trend oriented. So if you're Kohl's, you need an assortment in that store that appeals to younger, more trend oriented um, uh, consumers. And traditionally, 
Kohl's tried to buy the best deals that they could, and so the merchants spent all their open to buy very early in the season. And so when trends emerged, merchants didn't have extra dollars to buy into those trends. Um, the typical lead time at Kohl's for, for uh, apparel was 14 to 18 months. So they didn't, you know, by the time they got trend merchandise in, the trend had passed. Um, and so the, the, a lot of the, the um, sort of plan to, to improve for Kohl's is let's, let's give those merchants more open to buy to chase trends. Let's give those uh, merchants shorter lead times um, to match supply and demand more carefully. You know, things we've been talking about in retail forever that modern technology is making a little easier to do at scale. Um, a lot of uh, similar initiatives at, at uh, Macy's. Um, Macy's had, had a, a couple of sort of really interesting quotes. Um, they certainly talked about how digital disruption had, had uh, changed Macy's forever and that, you know, a lot of Macy's stores were built for a, a different era when people shop differently. And so, you know, one of, one of the, the significant components to a bold new chapter is to realign the Macy's fleet to a, a different store footprint that's more off mall. Um, but other parts of, of the, the Macy strategy were really about simplifying and modernizing the assortment in ways similar uh, to what we talked about uh, at Kohl's um, and, you know, better meeting the, the customer signals that they already have. Um, so a lot of good conversations about fundamentals. Forever 21 is another mall-based retailer um, that's talking about, you know, a, re, a, a, a refocusing on fundamentals to sort of improve their inventory position. Zappos talked about cutting 40% of their product assortment and increasing customer satisfaction. Um, and a couple of the real interesting fundamentals is, you know, one of the companies we talk a lot about disrupting commerce is Shein. They're a, 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 a Chinese a factory direct-to-consumer business in the United States. By many counts, they're the largest apparel retailer in the US, one of the largest apparel retailers in the world. And one of the differentiating features of their model is efficiency, that they do this small batch testing, that they see a trend on the internet, they recognize it with generative AI, and then they, they make uh, in a week um, a few thousand of a garment and sell it and learn from the demand signals of those few thousand whether they should make a bigger run. And so one of the things that Shein announced at this show is they're outsourcing that small batch testing model to other brands uh, that want to embrace that kind of uh, improved efficiency in their own inventory testing. Uh, Reformation, which is a direct-to-consumer brand, talked about how important small batch testing is to them um, and how they claim to have less than 1% of their goods go unsold versus a traditional apparel retailer might have 50% of their goods that have to be discounted to be sold or liquidated in some other way. Um, so really interesting focuses on uh, the basics. Um, and then the, the last of the four trends that we're going to talk about is uh, what I have dubbed the battle for attention. Um, and this really manifested itself um, in a, a few ways at the show. I mentioned uh, that Walmart was, was on several panels. Um, on their, their shoppable video panel, um, they, they talked a lot about uh, a program that they ran uh, this, this Christmas called Add to Heart. Um, and this was essentially a shoppable um, a, a, a video entertainment that they published on TikTok, YouTube, and their own channels. And it was essentially a 23-part uh, romantic comedy that they rebranded Romantic Commerce um, that was uh, uh, available with 230 items uh, that were uh, directly purchasable from within these these 23 um, short form video segments. So when you saw one of the main characters using a cool piece of luggage or or with a cool handbag, you, you could buy that product instantly. Um, and they uh, Jill talked about when they created the show, not only did they have to cast the characters and write the scripts, they had to cast the products. And they, they really thought about the products as other actors in the show that had to be cast um, much like all the other elements of this show, um, and how at Walmart that you know um, becoming a good mer uh, being a good merchant also means being good at media and storytelling uh, for the first time ever. I think this campaign uh, generated over two billion impressions for Walmart and drove uh, significant uh, sales and, and uh, traffic to their their own e-commerce practices. 
um, uh, Craig Bromers, who's the CMO at American Eagle, um, you know, talked about how in his own job, he's having to think more like a media company and less like a brand. Um, that he's now fighting for attention uh, with people doom strolling TikTok, right? Um, and that he's not just competing against other apparel brands for consumers' attention, he's competing against TikTok and uh, uh, YouTube for those consumers' attention and Twitch. And so, you know, he's having to change how he thinks about that. And nowhere at the show was this more evident than in the Mattel keynote where we had uh, the president of media standing next to the president of products and the two of them talking about how Mattel is not a toy company, it's not a media company, um, that it's a media and products company um, and that you know neither business is likely to be sustainable in the long run without the other. Um, and you know that the Barbie movie was responsible for something like 18% of their revenue last year uh, um, and that we, we should expect to see a lot more of those kinds of collab initiatives between media and product um, in the future of Mattel and many of uh, Mattel's competitors. Um, so kind of uh, as, as Jill from Walmart kind of expressed, this idea of shortening the distance between inspiration and purchase, um, that increasingly our tension is being driven by all these short form video formats that are across the web. And when those short form video con uh, uh, um, uh, formats generate any awareness or interest in purchase, we have to make it super easy and low friction um, for those customers to do that. And so retailers like Walmart are launching their own creator networks. Um, and so you, you, you know, Walmart has 30,000 uh, uh, independent creators in the Walmart creator network, which are producing content that helps sells Mattel products. Uh, Walmart bought uh, Vizio and ha now has a, a in in home video platform. Amazon obviously has the super powerful Prime platform. So lots of interesting things happening. Um, but maybe nowhere is the center of gravity stronger for the intersection of media and commerce um, than at the TikTok. Um, and so, uh, you know, the TikTok story is a, a particularly interesting one. They opened a, a click to buy feature TikTok shops last year. Um, and I want to introduce you to Guru Nanda uh, Cocoa Mint Pulling Oil. It is the best-selling SKU in the history of TikTok shops. It sells about 100,000 SKUs a week. It sold 1.2 million SKUs as of uh, the week before Shop Talk. Um, and so it's, it's a, a heavily discounted uh, product. I think it's 30% off of a 750 product. So it's like $6.4 million. I just did public math. I hope that's close. $6.4 million in revenue. So uh, a very successful product. We'd all be thrilled to throw a product up on TikTok and sell six or $10 million worth of product. Um, and that's very interesting. And that's a part of this new um, uh, con uh, commerce video format. But when I talk to people about uh, uh, video commerce, this is what they are all thinking of. They're all thinking of an add to cart button in the video and that the world is going to work like that. And this is the best selling product in the United States of America and it sold six million dollars, which is not a home run um, for most consumer categories. Um, so I want you, when you're thinking about video commerce and why this is so disruptive to commerce, not to just think about the, the coconut pulling oil, right? You know what it is? It's the Stanley Quencher. Right? Um, the st like, think of all the media impressions the Stanley Quencher gets across TikTok. Um, here's just a quick assortment of uh, um, uh, TikToks about the Stanley Quencher that got millions or tens of millions of views, and they are not shoppable in the traditional sense. I can't click immediately in all these little videos and buy a Stanley Quencher, but all these short form videos that won my attention um, when I'm, I'm uh, scrolling my TikTok feed um, at home uh, created the circumstances under which I became aware and wanted to buy a Stanley Quencher. In 2019, Stanley sold $70 million of this SKU. Um, last year, they sold $750 million worth of this SKU. Um, and so, you know, I want to remind everyone that the intersection of commerce and media is super important, that video commerce is a super rich, important part of the ecosystem, but it's not exclusively limited to live streaming, which is very narrow, or even native checkout video, that it's really, to me, video commerce is really about any video uh, that drives awareness and intent to buy things. Um, and going forward, if you want to be a successful merchant, if you want to be a successful retailer, 
um, you're going to need to be uh, involved in these kind of discovery um, and awareness moments that are uh, increasingly not going to happen on platforms that you own. Um, so that was a super interesting uh, set of conversations that happened at Shop Talk um, around the battle for attention. Um, so those were our, our big four trends. Um, I feel like we're, we're doing pretty well on time. We've used up almost all our allotted time. I haven't personally noticed um, any questions that seem like they're broad enough to answer in front of the, the whole group. So I'll give people one last chance. Um, if there's any, any questions that you want me to try to uh, take a swing at live, otherwise all the specific questions that folks ask, I'll be happy to send you a response offline on, on my spring break next week. Uh, but uh, as a reminder, uh, you know, generative AI is, is a real thing. It's simultaneously overhyped in terms of the benefit you can get today, but probably underhyped in terms of the disruption it's going to have in all our businesses. Uh, retail media is a real and growing thing, but it's much more nuanced how we measure it, um, uh, how we deploy it, uh, wh uh, what audiences it reaches are continuing to evolve very rapidly. Um, there's still a ton of uh, room and opportunity for retailers to win by getting the basics right and a lot of these new technologies you know the thing that they do most importantly is really um, enable us to be even better at the basics than we've ever been before um, and you know that the the time when when content and commerce were two separate paths that a consumer picked or two separate career tracks that an employee picked are gone now it's and now it's it's a uh, uh, commerce is a content type and it competes with all the other content types uh, for the precious uh, attention of our, our our consumers that are you know always being inundated with more and more opportunities. Um, so hopefully those uh, four trends help help eliminate any FOMO that you may have had if you weren't able to attend Shop Talk. If you were able to attend Shop Talk, I'd love to hear your feedback on whether I captured your observations or there's anything I missed. Um, as always, we're super grateful for your time and attention um, and love the, the collaboration uh, we have with all of you. And uh, hopefully we'll get to meet at uh, one of these events in person down the road. Um, and uh, so with that, I will wish everyone a very happy commercing.